George J. Beadle, the former director of the Texas prison system and a distinguished professor here at San Houston. Over the years, the series has hosted numerous esteemed scholars who have shared their research with students and faculty of the College of Criminal Justice. And today, it is my honor and a privilege as a Beatle Fellow to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Mary Marash, our esteemed Beatle Chair Speaker. Dr. Marash is a university distinguished professor at Michigan State University's School of Criminal Justice, where she has worked since 1978. She is also recognized as a Fellow of the American Society of Criminology. Her research interests and associated publications focus on various themes, including juvenile offenders, violence against women, women on probation and parole, and the simultaneous influence of personal agency and identity combined with the structure and the justice system response on quality of life and the offending of people who have broken the law. Since 2011, Dr. Mirage has collaborated with the faculty members in the Department of Communication at Michigan State to integrate communication and the criminal justice theory in its foundations of effective community supervision. She sees the involvement of numerous graduate students in field research that includes one-on-one -on -one interaction with study practitioners participants as a highlight of her career. And as a reason, she has high quality data to work with in her analysis and writings. Dr. Marash's contribution has garnered recognition through several prestigious awards, including the ASC Mentory Award, the Division on Women and the Crime Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Division on People of Color and the Crime Lifetime Achievement Award. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Marash to San Houston State University as our Beatle Chair Lecturer this academic year. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so today, uh, what I want to do is tell you the story of how the most recent book I published came about. Uh, the book is based on stories women who were on probation and parole told us. So we're kind of like putting things, one thing in another. So we have the stories of women, and I will talk about some of those, but also the story of the book and why I even wrote it uh, and a little bit of what is in it. Uh, I do need to thank the many agencies and people who helped create the research. Um, the Michigan State University Research Foundation started by giving us a partnership grant to do something that might help the Michigan Department of Corrections. National Science Foundation funded two consecutive grants, um, and so we were able to follow the same women over seven years. And also, the Michigan Department of Corrections gave us unprecedented access to data, to clients that they were supervising, and also to the probation and parole agents uh, who accommodated us in many ways. Um, also, the women who took part in the study that are the topic of the book I wrote were interviewed six times, and one of those times was a lengthy life story. Uh, and so really, they are the heroes of this book and the people who made it possible at all. Uh, as Dr. Zhang said, uh, this book and all of this research came out as a collaboration. And this is how our research team worked from 2011. We all aged a bit. Um, but I thought it would be good to have a, a, a picture then. Um, Jennifer Corbina Dungy um, was an assistant professor when she started with the project. Uh, Sandy Schmidt was, is a university distinguished professor in communication, and she brought the communication theory. And Deborah Cashy is a psychologist, and she added some of the psychological insights 
and did a lot of the data management in um, the analysis for the project. And as I said, I'm mostly going to talk about how the book came about. And by the end, I hope everyone understands what the title actually means. Um, I also hope you appreciate the color scheme of this book. Um, I was a little shocked when the publisher sent it to me and said it was so good she didn't even send me any alternatives. Um, but I grew to like it, and you can't lose a copy of this book. Um, you can always find it wherever you put it. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about pre-book research, the initial research which gave me the idea for this book. Uh, to understand what I'm going to say, you have to understand how probation and parole is organized in Michigan. Uh, the Michigan Department of Corrections, a state agency, is a central office that handles all felony offense probation and parole. And they also run the prisons and some other kinds of programs. Uh, local courts handle lower level misdemeanor and less serious felonies. Um, and they are not centralized and they're not coordinated with the Michigan Department of Corrections. So our sample was of women who had been convicted of a felony and who were supervised by the state system of uh, probation and parole. Also, the research started at the end which was a long time coming in Michigan of the 2008 recession. So there were welfare cuts going on. on uh, counties were running out of money to help people with medical expenses. So it was a really bad time uh, when we started our research in terms of state finances. Uh, we did in eventually recruit 402 drug-involved Michigan women on probation and parole to be in our research. Um, and we uh, were especially interested in studying Michigan because they were using gender, which really for Michigan is woman responsive reform uh, in their supervision practices. Uh, they, have, they used a risk assessment tool that was geared towards women. So in addition to things that matter for everybody, like finding a job, uh, they measured things like trauma, which actually also matters for men. But women are more often subjected to trauma before they get involved in the justice system. Uh, and they have, the assessment tool has questions that are especially relevant to women, such as, are you the sole provider for children? Um, and that's something women frequently are who are in the justice system. They also had women-specific caseloads, and the agents were trained to supervise women and focus on their needs and risks. They used collaborative case management, which meant they used evidence-based practices that had been developed for women, and so they were specific. Um, or they referred to the programs that had those practices. They used motivational interviewing, and they had extensive training uh, in motivational interviewing for all probation and parole agents. And in general, Michigan was trying to get people out of prison to keep people out because it was one of the worst states in terms of the proportion of the population that was in prison. And the legislators, even if they were not sympathetic to the needs of the people in prison, they were very attuned to the fact that we were spending more money on prisons than education in the state. And so they really tried to keep people out of prison. One of the things we found out very soon is in fact, the probation and parole agents who were supervising women were seen as non-punitive and as trustworthy and caring. So all of these changes and all of these efforts actually 
actually were implemented in Michigan. Um, many other states say they have done these things, but when you look at what really gets implemented, it's sort of a mixture of punishment and other kinds of help, caring, and that erodes trustworthiness when it's extremely punitive. And we also were able to document that uh, non-supportive, punitive relationships led to something called the Atkins, and that's where our psychologist helped us. The Atkins is, is when somebody tells you to do something or talks to you, and you try to do the opposite to sort of make a point that you're a free agent. Uh, and it also was followed by high anxiety, and those things contributed to recidivism. So the practices really seem to be working with quantitative data. Um, Jennifer Skeen, another researcher, has done a lot of research in this area and has actually used her measures in this field. And she has found the same thing, um, and that there is a true reduction in recidivism when these approaches are used to supervise people. I do have a couple examples of when you looked at the qualitative data, what the agents were really doing. Um, and this is from the point of view of women that were supervised. The women really liked it and felt they were helped when the agents understood the constraints imposed by neighborhood conditions, for example, lack of jobs and also the demands on them for child care or other family care, care for aging parents, care for disabled people in their families. Um, and when they understood that there were special problems related to mental illness and addiction, the women really appreciated it when the agents shared their knowledge of how to make it in the courts how to deal with child protective services, and when they advocated for them with local judges. Uh, referrals and advocacy were very much seen as helpful. Another thing that we were able to document is that women especially appreciated being coached to handle multiple agent supervision. So if you're from a rural area, you may not have a lot of crimes to commit if you're trying to support a drug addiction in your immediate community. So one thing people do in Michigan in rural areas to get money is they steal these uh, piping, the copper piping off of uh, irrigation pipes that go around. But they may go to multiple counties to do this. Um, and so they may actually be supervised by three different probation officers for offenses committed in multiple counties. And so when one of those agents, supervising agents, help coordinate and advocate within that system of supervision, that was extremely helpful. Also, um, women appreciated it when agents helped them build networks. And I'll talk about a woman whose pseudonym is Jolene. Um, and her agent, you'll see in her story, exposed her to multiple kinds of treatment programs, which gave her recovery practices. She ended up able to negotiate for herself and find the programs she needed. Finally, agents provided a lot of emotional esteem and informational support. So we had done this study, it took us three years, we learned all these things. And one thing I could see is, compared to some of my other research, I had ended up with what I call a research company. I had a group of interviewers who were incredible, who had often interviewed the same woman three times, in person, on her own territory. Um, and this meant I had the 
ability to gather even more instruments that we can very gather for research purposes. And just to give you an idea of the, the quality of these relationships that the interviewers had with, with the women, um, I'll just read you a few quotes from what the women said. The researchers got some really good feedback on the paper. Another one said, I could feel the heart of the last person who interviewed me. Another one said, I know, she said this to the uh, researchers, I know you're not judging me at all. You care about my well-being. And finally, another example is, I can tell you're compassionate, and you really listen, and that means a lot. So the women actually gained a lot just from being interviewed, and they appreciated that. And I, I wanted to maintain contact. I didn't want to lose that, those close relationships. Also, we had collected a tremendous amount of qualitative data. Uh, in these three interviews, then we, in the next study, we did a life story, and then we had two more interviews. Um, and we, as an aside, we were asking regularly about benefits. Did you need these benefits? Did you get them? Uh, did you need Obamacare? Um, how did you avoid victimization and law breaking in your community? Uh, what was the most helpful treatment program? How did it help? What have you done to make your life better? And then in the very final sixth interview, we asked, what was it like to be in our study? Um, and so, and what was it like to be on supervision? We also asked that. So we had literally a map of qualitative data. Um, and we, that was part of my research capital at the end. I also saw some theoretical dilemmas with what we had done so far with the first study. Uh, one was, what part does supervision play in the long run? You know, I, I, work, I used to work with kids in the courts many, many years ago, and I always thought, so much is going on at once. What can they, what can we possibly do? I mean, we could see them for a year, um, and some of that is, you know, going to court and all the procedures and that sort of thing. So there's much more to a person's life than their contact with the justice system. And the solution we came up with was to do the second study, and that would include a interview where we would collect the entire life story from a woman. And um, we chose women who had at least five convictions before the first interview in 2011, because we wanted to study deficits. So if somebody hasn't been breaking the law very much, you can't study deficits, because it's, you know, you need to have something there to stop. Um, and so that was the group of women we asked to tell their life stories, although we continue to interview all the other women uh, about other things. Um, and to gather life stories, we really built on Shad Maroon's work, and as you probably know from your court's work uh, and from your teaching um, and your own research, um, he emphasized the need people have to look at their past pieces of behavior and somehow make good of it um, and sort of restore themselves. And he calls that that's narrative identity theory, and uh, he, he really emphasized making good. Um, I delved back into narrative identity theory that Shad had studied when he was at Northwestern, and I got very interested in contamination and stagnation, which happens um, when you don't make good and you don't have redemption from your past, uh, but you're left uh, feeling your life is ruined and you're not able to move ahead at that point. I put
presented this on Monday to my clients who were board students. And uh, they afterwards told me that they ha still didn't know what I was talking about when I talked about contamination. So I have a little example. One of the youngest women in our study um, was in a state of contamination. We interviewed her for the life story when she was 23. And between the ages of 17 and 23, she had spent the entire time either in jail, in prison, or between those days in various probation situations. Uh, she saw herself as completely unemployable because she would suffer from, um, from a condition where she uh, would lose consciousness. She had lost two babies. Um, one, somebody pushed her down the stairs. Another, she gave birth in prison. And the baby was stillborn. She had been in only abusive relationships with men. And she was totally traumatized uh, during the life story. Uh, she said she never saw herself as able to live on her own. Um, she, so she was living with a mother who had abused her and ignored her pleas for help when her brother sexually assaulted her. Um, and that is contamination. She, she was doing nothing. She couldn't work. And she kind of narrowed her whole view of her life to just surviving basically. Now hopefully something will happen in the future and that will change, but that's where she was up at that point. So that was theoretical dilemma one. We need the whole story, not just the time that's involved with the criminal justice. Um, Theoretical dilemma number two was that people seemed rather dis decontextual. I mean, some of these women lived in on farmland, small towns, um, the heart of Detroit, really bad neighborhoods, uh, and that was sort of lost by what we had done. Um, That's the same. Okay, and I'll go back to the other one. Um, one woman summed it up and said it all depends on where you live in terms of stigma, uh, racial bias, that sort of thing. And so the way I handled that, I thought this was pretty creative. Um, I couldn't drive around to a hundred and ten women's houses uh, and look at where they were living, but there's this great real estate stuff on there where you can get a picture of everybody's house and you can even do a tour of their neighborhood. And so I took the women who we gathered life stories from and I did that. Um, I looked at where they actually lived and tried to make sense of it. If they lived in an apartment building, I read the reviews uh, online of the apartment building. So in Michigan, cities aren't high-rise, horrible buildings in bad neighborhoods. They're more closely, densely packed houses. And as you can see, uh, some of these houses look okay. Uh, they have light and they're kind of well kept. Uh, and this is true for all of the deindustrialized uh, areas in Michigan, Saginaw, Pontiac, certainly Detroit, Flint, these cities where the auto industry left and the recession was just devastating, uh, had houses like this. But the interesting thing is, when you toured the neighborhood, some houses looked okay, but right around the corner, there'd be a totally boarded up house um, or a house that had been burnt down. People were so desperate to get rid of drug houses that neighbors would burn down the house to get rid of it. Um, and so 
many of the black women in the study lived in inner city areas uh, because of housing discrimination and housing unavailability. They were stuck in these areas. These areas tended to have very low legal job opportunities and very high illegal job opportunities, selling drugs, prostitution, and that sort of thing. We also had women in small towns and rural areas, so I tried to take that into account. Uh, and as I said, some of these places that looked okay when you read the reviews, say at trailer parks or apartment buildings, it was clear they weren't okay. Uh, the reviews would mention roaches, um, both marijuana roaches and bug roaches, um, and uh, you know, toxic bites, assaults in the building, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, even people who live in what you would call a, a decent neighborhood without a high crime area do have the problem of what goes on in that household, which may be quite abusive. Anyway, I think that's up there. Okay, so this was theoretical dilemma two, which I don't know will be in kind of order. Um, one was, I, so I had all this data, and it was the first summer of COVID. So I was stuck at home, and I keep reading this qualitative data and reading this qualitative data, and I felt a lot of pressure because these women have poured their hearts out to me, and I had to do something with all this qualitative data. Um, I could see that while mo from that graph, most of the agents were offering the evidence-based preferred trained method of supervision, not all were. So there was a variation there. Uh, circuit court judges and district court judges were not under the control of the Department of Corrections. So despite what agents wanted to do, supervising agents, uh, they might put people in jail, they might be very punitive, they might you know, levy these huge costs on people who couldn't afford them. There was also a problem of medical insurance terms. People were on and off medical insurance. So they were on medical insurance, um, and then the county would close the list because the county ran out of money and they were off medical insurance. Or when there are federal programs, when they were pregnant or right after the baby was born, they could get certain kinds of medical insurance, but then they couldn't. Or sometimes they could get some kind of medical insurance during those periods, but they couldn't get treatment for themselves for diabetes. Um, so there was this constant churn. You never, from year to year, month to month, women never knew when they were going to get medical insurance or not. Michigan had a terrible affordable housing shortage. It still does, actually. It's one of the worst states. Uh, it had welfare cuts going on um, and waiting lists for what little housing there was to get a voucher. Um, and then we have employer and landlord decisions that discriminated against people with a history of conviction. And if you're not aware of how bad that can be, um, I mentioned this at dinner last night with the nice people who took me out to dinner. Uh, there's a book called Digital Punishment, and it's about the fact that um, once you're on the, on the network as having a conviction, or being arrested, even if you're not convicted, you may never be able to get off. There just may be no way uh, that you can get off of that. So now we need to go. Oh, good slide. Okay. So I've got all this data. And I can see more is going on than making good and contaminating. 
I saw intertwined and contradicting effects of community supervision, residential contacts, income sources, agencies, programs, and broader policy and social structure were affecting the lives of the women. And I kept thinking, what is this, what are these women telling us? What is my data telling me? And how do I organize all this data? Because it was in all different data sets and it was qualitative, but it was thankfully in a qualitative data analysis software, so that was good. Um, and how do I even begin to look for patterns, anomalies, and trends? So this was my solution. Um, this is not an actual picture of my backyard, I don't know why, but it, my backyard is quite similar to this. Um, and it was the first summer of COVID, so like I said, I had my home office, my living room, my kitchen, and my backyard. And so I just kept thinking about what, how am I going to, what am I going to do with this data? And I also kept thinking about the interviewers who had poured so much into gathering the data and the women who had given us so much data, um, partly because of the relationship with the interviewers. So after time in the hammock, um, I came up with this book. And it's really uh, stories that show the intertwining of women's agency, because of course they make decisions, not always good decisions. Uh, agent action, what the supervising agents actually did. Neoliberal policies, which are policies that emphasize individual responsibility for whatever, for being poor, for being sick, for being addicted, uh, being unemployed, and residential location. And so I tried to weave all of that, or tease it maybe, out of the stories. So I'll give you one of the stories in depth, and then um, a couple of contrasts briefly. So this is the story of Jolene. She was a white woman, uh, and she was from the western part of the state, a small town, a very small town. Um, and as I tell her story, you'll see she was involved in parole, parole, safety net programs, job market problems, mental health treatment, jail, prison. She lived in a small town, but she spent time in Detroit, and Broadly, she was involved with the Michigan Department of Corrections. She also was in a place where she experienced a lot of conflicting political contacts. So we had a retracting of the helping safety net. Um, and at the same time, the safety net is supposed to help people. Uh, the state was trying to reduce prison populations, but other people were trying to get people in jail. Uh, and sometimes, and of course in Michigan, many of the jails are hard to be there. So budget-wise, keeping the jails full uh, actually helped keep them going. Um, there was also a situation that until the middle of our research, people who were 17 were considered to be adults. So we had 17 years old going to um, the jail. And that um, did change, but I would raise the question, when we think of middle class people of color, uh, we think of this concept of continued adolescence into the mid 20s. Um, and so why not extend that to people in trouble with the law? Because frankly, the difference between 17 and 18 or 19 is not all that different uh, in our society. Um, we had an emphasis on punishment and deterrence, but the Department of Corrections was trying to rehabilitate and reintegrate. Uh, we had programs that dealt with thinking errors inside the person, 
but the person was heavily affected by uh, structural and institutional and contextual constraints. Mickey Jones um, feels I really like to read her stuff called it the page of constraints that people were in. So Jolene growing up. So when Jolene was growing up, her mother uh, was prostituting in front of her and using crack cocaine in front of her. Uh, and in fact, at age 13, Jolene's mom introduced her to crack. And Jolene said in her interview, that ruined my life, basically. Unlike many of the women in their girlhood who drifted away from abusive homes or homes that just weren't somewhat functioning or who ran away maybe to join an angry boyfriend or something like that, Jolene's mother ran away. Um, she dropped Jolene off after she sold all the belongings in her household and moved to Florida. And she left Jolene living with uh, her boyfriend and his mother, who was still very young at this point. And the mom said, I can't support you. So Jolene started stealing and committing other crimes. By 17, she was in jail. And sitting at the table, you know, they have those day rooms in jail where people can come to play cards or something. Uh, sitting at the table, uh, another person taught her how to cook meth. And when she got out, she couldn't wait to do it. The next time uh, she went to jail, she heard women talking about shooting up and how great it was and how you could really get high. Um, and so when she got out, she tried it. She got more addicted. And she sort of summed it up. Yeah, I learned all that stuff, did all that stuff being in jail when I could have been sitting in a group and learning how to change my way of thinking. So I think it's interesting because by the time we interviewed her, she had been through programs in prison and other treatment programs. And she really uh, sort of ascribed to these cognitive therapies. She understood that she had to better connect her feelings, uh, her experiences to her actions to keep herself out of trouble. And she was willing to change her thinking. When she did end up in prison at age 19, uh, she thought, she told us she thought she was going to end up killing herself uh, the way she was choosing to live, and she did all the programming she possibly could. Uh, and there is actually quite a bit of programming in Michigan prisons. Um, and she took steps to change that. When she got out of prison, she didn't want to go back to her hometown because the treatment there, the aftercare, would have been in groups with all the people who were abused. And so that didn't seem to make sense. So she worked with uh, Michigan Department of Corrections, and she was paroled to Detroit, where she took a 90-day gender-responsive uh, substance abuse treatment program. And again, she seemed to get good treatment. She learned how to recognize her urges, let them pass, um, think through what was going to happen next. Uh, she also learned pretty much to forgive people, forgive her own past, not dwell on it. And she learned to change, um, like her negative thoughts into something simple and positive. So just think for yourself, is there evidence of cognitive behavioral approaches here? Yes. Changing how she sees things, how she thinks. There's even evidence of making good in that she's trying to take her negative thoughts and do something good with them, at least for herself. Um, the treatment program is a highly gender responsive program. A lot of the women we talked to had been there 
and have found it extremely helpful. Uh, she got very close to her counselor. Uh, her counselor was very emotionally supportive of her. And the program helped her make good. It shows her as a speaker, and she talks about speaking at podiums and things like this, and uh, sharing her stories in front of a lot of people. So 90 days later, she ends up in transitional housing. Uh, and Detroit has one of the worst uh, transportation, public transportation systems in the country. So she was having a lot of trouble uh, getting herself back to the house on time. So she would be allowed to go out and look for jobs or go to mental health treatment, uh, but she'd always be coming back late. Um, so I think this is an interesting quote up here um, because it kind of shows you the quality of some of the relationships agents formed with the people they supervise. Uh, the agent came up to the housing counselor and put her in touch. Um, she says, I'm going to tell you right now, she's not from around here. She's got out of prison. She don't even know how to ride a bus. And if she's out, not out being able to get those buses, she's never going to know how. She needs to look for jobs. She needs to be um, able to do that stuff. Uh, she's been here because she's trying to help herself. And so the housing program was trying to restrict her even more and tell her she couldn't go anywhere. And the agent came up and advocated for her. Uh, and the um, housing counselor called Jolene a liar. And Jolene was particularly pleased because her agent said, you know, a liar is a really harsh word to call someone. You know that? I like her a lot, Jolene was saying about the counselor. She's so blunt and funny. And then, like, we're walking out of the counselor's office, the housing counselor, and she, the agent, giggles and goes, if you need anything else, call me. I'm on your side. I'm here to help you, you know. So things seem to be getting worked out. The pull of play, the bottom line, Jolene just couldn't follow up on all these referrals. She continued to have trouble in transitional housing. She wasn't used to living in Detroit. Uh, she didn't know what areas were safe, what areas weren't safe. Uh, so she moved back home. She let her 19-year-old uh, cousin live with her, trying to help him get off drugs. He stole her rent, she kicked him out, he overdosed that night and died. And so she relapsed. Uh, and she explained, she understood why. Um, you're looking for the easiest way to escape from feeling all this shit. When I went using it was like my way, you know, of not having to face the reality of the fact that he was gone. I didn't want to deal with it. And I didn't want to keep feeling that way and I was that I was feeling. I was looking for some way to relieve me. So she immediately realized this was not a good situation, that he was back on drugs. So she tried to go to a detox place, um, and they stopped giving her um, a drug that would reduce her cravings. After, four, uh, after just four days, and they wouldn't listen to her saying she needs to change her eating. She then found herself another place which gave her Suboxone, which similarly reduces uh, the withdrawal and heroin symptoms. And she started a full-time job, and she got a car. So she was, again, doing pretty good. So she has a job, and she's making 200 a week. Her rent is 700 a week. So she has her welfare cut and loses her Medicaid. Um, they cut her food stamps and her Medicaid. So she can't pay for her Suboxone. And her relatives and friends were trying to help her raise the money to do this, uh, but she just, she just couldn't manage. So she's back on drugs again. 
she was, it's right in the middle of her relapse. Um, and this is how she saw the whole situation. If I could get my Medicaid back, then I can get my Suboxone. When I get that, my job told me I could have my job back. But I can't because I'm using, you know, to keep my body normal because I don't have, I don't have my Suboxone because I don't have Medicaid to get it. So, and I don't use heroin, you know, to get high. I use it to keep well because otherwise I can't get out of bed unless I'm using it. So there is actually a good ending as far as we know after this. Um, she had a new conviction. But on her own, she returned to Detroit and signed herself up for a nine-month different residential treatment program. And she describes it as helping her find work, uh, opening up, putting structure in her life. And then she returned for her probation sentence, uh, or for her sentence after her conviction after the nine months, and uh, she actually was put back on probation, and she completed it in a year. So she was basically okay, um, at least as far as we know. Uh, so what you see is a system of pushes and pulls, falling back, moving forward in context, and all of the forces on her, uh, early on, family, Child welfare, where were they? Uh, 17 jail where she gets turned on to drugs. Uh, treatment in a small town where she knows all the users. Uh, treatment that won't listen to her. Safety net fails her. The agent did use all of the best practices, got her all the referrals, advocated for her. Um, she did change. There was evidence of redemption and using cognitive behavioral therapy for her benefit. Um, and she did finally end up with what I call recovery capital in that she was able to find her own different programs to detox and then go to a treatment program. I'm going to give you just a couple contrasts because these stories are long. But this, I'm going to tell you part of the story. This is about Raven. She's 38, black, different life stage, totally different community context. She lives in a terrible neighborhood in Detroit. She started using drugs uh, when she was a child uh, because she, her stepfather raped her from 10 to 15 years old. And as she put it, so of course I got high. I did heroin, coke, a lot of drugs. Uh, but recently, her offenses were uh, attacking back friends. And she was on probation for that. Uh, she had a lot of pressures on her, uh, family responsibilities. Uh, she had five children. One husband had been, one father had been killed. The other was in jail, or not jail, prison for years. He wasn't coming out soon. Uh, so she had these five children to take care of. Um, her, she had an ailing mother, aging, ailing mother, and four developmentally disabled adult brothers who were deteriorating, and she knew she would be the caretaker once her mother couldn't help at all. Um, she did have agent advocacy to handle the cost of supervision. The agent went to the judge and said, look, she's not making enough money to support herself, and you can't keep you know, punishing her for this. Um, and also the agent got her family counseling to stop help with some of those things. Um, but she just couldn't get out of the neighborhood, and she couldn't find a job. She did try to get training for jobs, so she got uh, licenses in uh, caring for other people, phlebotomy, various things like that. 
Uh, and she was part of the 12,000 families that in the 2011-2012 time period were cut from welfare because Michigan didn't have the money. So she had housing help, uh, but no financial help. She also had extreme stress uh, from living uh, in the area. She talked about gangbangers. She probably had to stay away from them. She had her children sleep on the second floor so they wouldn't be shot by stray bullets while she was sleeping. Um, she saw her kids' friends uh, using drugs at an early age, breaking and entering. So this is how she handled mothering. On Mondays, they go to church from not 5 to 9. Tuesdays, they go from 4 to 8. Wednesdays, they go from 5 to 9. Thursdays, they go from 6 to 10. Fridays, they go from 5 to 10.30. Saturdays, they go from 9 to 12. And Sundays, they go from 9 to 5. So she basically had her kids either in school or church constantly. And she protected herself by leaving the house only to look for work, check the mailbox, or watch the children from program to program at the door. And that's what she did all day. Um, she, she is really a prime example of an economically and geographically marginalized black woman. And that resulted heavily from cuts to welfare. Uh, she was in work first. That's why she was able to get housing vouchers, uh, but they never were able to help her get a job because of her criminal history. Um, and the only place she could live was in a really dangerous neighborhood where she was afraid for herself and her kids, but also that her kids would be pulled into the street. I want to contrast her with a very different interesting situation. Jenny is a white woman, high school grad, and she had actually worked uh, in landscaping before she got involved with a man. She did have a, a difficult home life. She was abused by her stepfather, and she moved in with a man at 16. They started making and selling meth. Um, and that's why she went to prison for two years. Uh, when she got out, though, she was hired back into the landscape business, and the, the uh, employer actually helped her buy a car. Um, but she describes why she was different from women like Reagan this way. I have mind over matter, that I'm strong-willed. I'm outgoing because, you know, I didn't stop. I put in maybe 150 applications. Compared to other women coming out of prison, the way I look at it is, I didn't, if I didn't have kids out here to go home to, I had some, I did have, or wait, she's saying the other women didn't have kids out here. I had something out here I needed to strive for. But don't forget, Raven had five kids and she was devoting her life to keeping them safe and in program. And Clearly, Jenny had a much easier time finding work, and the work was with people she knew, and they provided a lot of other kinds of financial support, emotional support, that sort of thing. So I think this raises an important question about what Jenny believed in, sort of a neo neoliberal approach, that is Raven's fault that she's in dire state. Uh, but also just it raises questions about neoliberal policies generally uh, versus paying attention to structural and, and uh, contextual difficulties. So did the woman responsive reform work in Michigan? Clearly, multiple agents really did help women while they were on probation and parole. However, we followed them way beyond the time they were on probation and parole. And no matter 
what individuals support. Many women stayed in low resource, high crime areas, lacked decent employment or other financial resources, or they had sporadic mental health and mental health care. And this is why the book is called In a Box. And I actually didn't think about In a Box until I found one woman's comment. This woman's name is Tina, so excuse my name. Um, this is what she said. I think there are some really good people who have probation officers. And I think they are very limited, and they probably become very discouraged because they could probably do more to help individuals. But I think they're put in a box, and we were put in a box. And the outcome, I don't think, was very helpful then for anyone. I mean, Agent Laudel, I remember because he was, he was really, you could tell. I think given the opportunity to, he could have really helped some people. But number one, their caseloads were overwhelming. And they didn't have the time or the resources to help people the way they wanted. It wasn't just about me. They had limits, courts, and rules, whatever. You know, they were just as much boxed in as I was. So clearly, um, probation agents can help women address individual challenges, addiction, depression, anxiety, uh, lack of income to some extent. But they cannot offer the context and structures that disadvantage people who have a criminal history live in poverty or are in minoritized groups. No matter the individual supports provided, many women remain confined to very dis desperate situations. So I don't want to leave, end this on this depressing note. Um, and I do this in every class I teach. I try to point to areas of hope and change. So uh, when I came to write the last chapter of the book on reform, it was overwhelming because I would have had to go back in the hammock and figure out uh, how can I possibly talk about all the reform. So instead, what I finally decided to do is Talk about the reforms the women said they needed. Um, so remember Jolene said that instead of being sent to jail at 17, she should have been sent to some type of program uh, where they helped her deal with her drinking problem. Um, Jolene also had a lot to say about public policy. I just feel there needs to be more experts. Um, I just feel there needs to be more resources for the poor. I just think that people don't have, I guess, a whole lot of support. I think, you know, there should be more opportunity. Um, what do people expect? I mean, they don't want people to use drugs and commit crimes. But then they don't want to give people the resources not to. That doesn't make any damn sense to me, you know, like, they want to punish people for an addict, being an addict. That's stupid. Other reforms cut the cost of supervision. Um, it's clear, I didn't go into it in a lot of detail, but all these fines, fees, costs, uh, you, have, you, get, you get charged to be supervised. You get charged to be in jail. Um, that that would be tremendously helpful. Reducing incarceration, Michigan, the big problem is no longer the prison. I mean, it's still a problem, but it's not as big as the jail problem. Uh, people are in and out of jails constantly. Uh, there needs to be fewer people on supervision because then people supervising them could actually have more time to help them. And barriers to employment are a huge problem. And actually,
actually in Michigan there have been some changes. Um, because of COVID, uh, sort of oddly, uh, people figured out you didn't have to make individuals come down to the office to get courts. It was done virtually, and they've kept that. Uh, they've allowed people to keep reporting that way. Uh, they've set limitations uh, on when you can return uh, somebody to prison. So it's very hard for an agent, uh, a parole agent, to uh, make a recommendation that someone should go back to prison. Technical violations don't result in prison. They usually result in referrals for treatment. Uh, there's a lot of monitoring and training of agents, and in fact, after the study was complete, all these studies were complete, uh, they trained 12,000 community corrections, prisons, and administrative staff in motivational interviewing. And they set up a system to sustain this by having mentors, like super motivational interviewers, embedded in the department who would continue training within wherever they were working uh, and support people trying to use this approach, which of course starts with what people want to do with their lives. Uh, there have been a number of jail reforms. Uh, Pew Charitable Trust worked with uh, the governor's office and several agencies and with some criminologists and came up with uh, changes that have been made in the law. Police use citations for low-level offenses instead of jail. Uh, failure to appear in court gets you a summit, doesn't get you a return to jail. It gets you a chance to reschedule. Uh, jail sentences are to be used for only the most serious misdemeanors. Uh, there have to be alternatives to jail for young people. Elimin they have eliminated mandatory minimums for jail sentences and limited jail time for technical probation violations. Uh, and there's a pending legislation to invest in mental health treatment more, invest in mental health movement. Now, these were just named. Um, they were passed in 2021. It, it remains to be seen how fully they're being implemented. Um, I'm going to leave you with sort of one more thought, where should we invest? I found this fascinating study uh, that used uh, sort of economic modeling and looked at 50 states um, and saw what kinds of invest investments were related to lower levels of two kinds of crime. So welfare and, in, and education investment was related to lower violence and property crime. Law enforcement investment was related to only lower property crime. And corrections spending was related to higher levels of both kinds. And uh, this was very troubling because I was trying to write a book about the reforms that were affected but I realize most correctional spending is for jails, for punishment, prisons, buildings, uh, that sort of thing. So it doesn't really contradict the idea that some supervision can be helpful, uh, but massive investment in corrections is usually massive investment in supervision, in uh, jails and prisons. Okay. So I want to end by thanking the attentive audience. If you hadn't been attentive, I'm not sure what I would have done with this topic. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Yang Zhang. Um, she's been driving me all over pl the place, and I didn't want to say anything, but it's you're so you're terrifying compared to where I'm from. I mean, it's like you drive in this. I don't know if it's better to drive in the slow lane or the fast lane. Uh, and also the many people that have hosted me for breakfast and dinner last night and, and also lunch. So 
Thank you. Happy to ask, answer questions. Oh, repeat the question? I are there any questions? Yes. So um, to get the initial sample for study one in 2011, I drove to um, probably 80 reporting centers around the state and I talked to agents that supervise women and I basically said, you're doing something really unique. Nobody else is doing this statewide in a in, in the country or the world, as far as I know, um, we'd like to learn more about it. And so we drive to your house in recruiting um, women on your caseload, basically. And also, we would ask you to fill out some surveys about how you interact with those women. And I think it really helped us that it was brand new and they were all excited about their new positions or new ex new job assignments. Uh, so they really wanted to share this, the agents did. Uh, so we got incredibly high response rate. I think we approached 77 agents and 73 said yes. Um, and so then to recruit the, um, the, the 402 women, we went, um, I, I sat and went through their caseloads and figured out ways to take a random sample of eligible women. We only in, interviewed uh, women who were drug involved, mostly using huge addiction as a caseload. Um, but that's the largest group of women who on probation and parole and we didn't want to have too small a group of the largest group. Like if we had had just purely economic offenders with no drug involvement, you know, that's a whole other story. Uh, it needs its own book and its own history, definitely. Um, to get the 118, um, oh, and so when, then when the interviews went out, and I did do some of the interviews, to recruit the women, we went to where they were. We then met them at the reporting center. Um, and we said, we just want to improve probation and parole. So we need people who are on probation and parole to give us their insight. And we always treated them as the experts, because actually they were the experts on their lives and their experiences. Um, and so, as I said, we built up these relationships over three interviews. Then we did a phone interview for the second study. And then we picked women with five or more convictions before the first study. Um, and at, we called them and the interviewers would say, we have a really different kind of interview. We're trying to understand this women's lives when they've been on probation and parole before and after. And would you help us? And I think treating them as contributors to the research, um, for those we could reach and find, almost all agreed. Um, and then I, I will say it, it's really hard to schedule uh, interviews with people who have difficult lives. So we put up with a lot of canceled appointments, missed appointments, 
you know, interviewer drives to Detroit to interview three people. One shows up, um, you know, that kind of thing. But we just figured we had to invest in that because their lives were very just sort of chaotic often. Not all of them, but many of them. So does that answer the question? I've been trying to do a couple things. Uh, one is I've been trying to get the book to advocates. And so I've been driving around <laughs> Nancy and meeting with groups and um, distributing, giving them free copies so that they can maybe use it in their work. Uh, Michigan Department of Corrections, to be honest with you, I don't know how they're going to use the book, but they were the first ones I gave it to. I gave copies to the people who had helped me. And um, I mean, they didn't hire me to write the book, so hopefully they will use the book. Um, and I always told them what I was doing, so it wasn't like a shock that, oh my goodness, you took this data and told them about you. Um, and with policy makers, okay, so in the Department of Corrections, if I had one recommendation to make to them, it would be to be actively lobbying in welfare, insurance, um, that sort of thing comes on the line. But that's a political issue, and it would be a recommendation. I don't know if they would do it. Um, and I'm trying to get the book to legislators who are forward-leaning, who've made some of these other reforms. Um, so that doesn't really answer what would be the one thing. I think it would be that you have to reach out to these other systems. These other systems need to stop doing what they're doing, these cuts, because we have a Department of Corrections that is doing evidence-based work that seems to be highly effective. And then, as you see with Joe and other systems and do there needs to be a lot more coordination. Other questions? That is a huge dilemma because for those seven, now eight, nine years has gone by, and we haven't been in touch for maybe two years, and some of the women we haven't been in touch for was longer. And so on the one hand, you want to remake contact when they may know, they might want to forget the whole experience of being in the justice system. Or they may be in really bad shape. Things might not be, they may be relapsed, whatever. So we, I'm actually trying to figure out what to do. Um, but what I am doing is part of what I, um, I was part of my answer to the last question which is I'm going to advocacy groups who often include people who've been in the system. And I'm trying to get their feedback on the book and get them to use the information. But I don't really have an answer to that. I'd, I'd be interested if somebody else did it because, you know, I don't know if women want us to come back and we didn't ask them if they'd like us to come back. And I don't know what happens to them afterwards. Some just want to be somewhere else. They, 
they don't, they weren't catching the cats. They really felt like they were. Does anyone else have an answer to that one? Food? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Films like his one or two of the theaters, you know, it's a traditional sort of agent, but it was about a particular one. And that was mostly used to to compare it to the quantitative data we had from the survivors of the Holocaust, from the women. And um, we have informal, like anecdotal, information. Most of the people who do the women's specific case studies wanted to do them. Uh, in fact, at first only women were doing them and men sued the department and wanted equal opportunity to to study them. And they won, so now there are more men supervising women. Um, they all have to go through specialized training, but we really, I don't really and that would be an interesting study. Okay. Other? So if you are planning to buy the book or anyone else, I, I didn't come to sell my book, but I do have 30% off coupons if you would like them. So come up afterwards and I'll give you one. I felt kind of funny that it's me that had might as well get the 30% off if you want the book. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, so one thing, Michigan State University has a type of grant um, that I was able to get. So I have, I was able to buy a large number of books to send to politicians, to give to politicians, um, I'm trying to watch, like, if bills come up in Michigan or federally to cut welfare, cut food stamps, cut these things, to find the advocates in those settings and get them the book and mark the sections as your book advocate.